first off, um, there is a GitHub repository that has the notebook and all of the materials and stuff that we're going to use today. GitHub.com slash T-H-A-R-M-A-3 slash school underscore of underscore data and underscore 24. So um, if you've got the notebook open, um, great. Welcome to Open Source APIs. We're going to cover three different open source APIs today. We're going to talk about the Census API, the US Census API, which if you've worked with Census data before, um, you know that this sort of like, you might know that the, U, the like UI experience for interacting with Census data is like lots of clicking, lots of like navigating around. It's a little hard to work with. I think the Census API is amazing. There's a really robust user community. They have a Slack channel. So if you like get a taste of it today and want to learn more, there's so many resources for the Census API. Um, we're also going to talk about the Open Data Websites API, so easy ways to programmatically use data sets that are stored on the Open Data website. Um, and then finally, we're going to talk a little bit about the GeoClient API, which is a way to geocode New York City addresses. New York City only. I'm sorry to anybody who's here from New Jersey or um, any other part of outside the five boroughs. We cannot geocode your addresses for you. But within New York City, it is a great tool and resource. It's free. Um, and it can bring back all sorts of um, valuable geographic information about an address beyond sort of what you would get from you know, just a latitude, longitude um, geocoding service um, like the uh, BBL, the borough block lot, the bin number, all sorts of different pieces of information that um, you're not, you know, you're not going to get from Google. Okay, all right. So first off, what is an API? API stands for Application Programming Interface, which is basically just a way for two computers to talk to each other. So um, I'm not a computer scientist at all, so this is like very, very quickly outside of my depth. I'm sure there are folks in here who could give you a master class about APIs. Um, I am not one of them, but um, uh, it is basically like you know we're writing this computer program to say. I'm a computer over here, like, hey, computer over there, I want this piece of information, please send it back to me. Um, so you actually see like one of the packages that we work with is called requests, because that's literally what we're doing. We're sort of requesting a piece of information from another computer and saying, please send it to me. Um, most APIs, although not all of them, the Open Data website, for example, does not require you to do this, um, require you to authenticate in some way. So they, they require you to, to tell them who you are. Um, so, you know, give me, a, it usually looks like a, you know, like a, a subscription code or something like that. Um, the census and GeoClient both require them in the notebook and in the GitHub repository. There's links to the places that you need to go in order to authenticate to get a subscription key for those services. It's pretty fast. Um, so, like, if you, if you register right now for a census key, it should be in your email, like, you know, almost immediately. Um, and uh, uh, it's it, it they people ask that basically because obviously like calling a database, calling you know asking another computer for something like requires some resources, and people do want to kind of like keep an eye on the API usage. Um, but Open Data doesn't require it. So if you don't register for if you don't want to register for a subscription key for the Census or for GeoClient, that's totally fine. You can still follow along. Um, but the Open Data portions of the of the notebook should run just fine. Um, uh, so, any questions before we dive into the to the census? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yep. It, it 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 should represent the data sort of as it is in the in the database that you are asking it from at that moment in time. But this is a really like important plug for almost anything is read the documentation. <laughs> Because different APIs could be set up different ways for the census and for open data and for um, GeoClient. It sort of it reflects the data as it currently stands. But um, uh, for the for the census, for example, right? There's like lots of different census products. You could be looking for you know data from the American Community Survey or from the Decennial Census. 
Um, and uh, and what you get back, like you really just need to make sure that you have asked for the right thing. The hard, the nice thing about APIs, right, is like computers talking to computers, so it's like pretty fast and easy. The bad thing is that the other computer is generally not going to help you out if you're failing. It's not going to be like, I see you're looking for this. Like maybe actually what you meant is this. Like it's going to be like, nah, not for you. No data today. And like it may give you a more or less informative error code. Um, so just yeah, it's a it's a double-sided coin. The talking to computers business. Okay. Is everybody who has a computer, did they were they able to like open up? We're, I'm using Google Colab, which is this really great sort of free Python interpreter um, for Jupyter Notebooks and other things. Um, if you are in the GitHub repository on the, um, if you go to this open source APIs school of data, it hopefully should have a little button at the top that says open in Colab. Um, so if you uh, use Google products, are comfortable using Google products, and want to open this in Colab and run the cells along with me, you can totally do that. Um, otherwise, you can just look at the notebook as we go through. And I tried to make sure that I really commented out what each step of the, of the notebook meant. First thing we're going to do, we're going to need a bunch of different packages. And packages in Python are basically just like little bits of software that can help you do a specific task in Python. Um, we have a bunch of different packages related to sort of handling data, to handling um, uh, uh, requests, um, so API requests. Um, in addition, we have a couple of different things related to mapping um, because we're going to make a couple maps um, with some of the data that we find um, as we go through this notebook. So I'm going to run this uh, run this cell. Um, to run a cell, you hit Shift Enter, or you can just push that little play button next to it. Um, and I have already done this, so it's going to mostly tell me that all of the things that I needed to install are already installed. Um, we are, um, for the census, we're going to use the five-year American Community Survey estimates. For, so for those of you who've worked with census products before, there's a, a bunch of different options. The American Community Survey, um, who knows the difference between a survey and a census? Anybody? Yeah, what good is it? Yeah, yeah. A census is an attempt to talk to every single person. There's no sampling. The intent is to talk to every single person. Um, and a survey, there's some sort of sampling, right? We're assuming that we can't talk to everybody, so we're going we're gonna to strategically pick the people that we're going to try to talk to so that they're representative of the broader population. So the census, the US census, has these two major project, products. One is the, the census, where they sincerely attempt to talk to every American, which if you think about it is completely insane. And also the American Community Survey, where they send out a survey um, every year to a sub to a sample of Americans. If you ever get an American Community Survey, I got one once. It was like the best day of my life. Um, it was so fun. They ask so many questions. And it's really detailed. Um, it's really detailed information. Um, the problem is, is they obviously, they can't talk to every single person. So the, sense, the um, American Community Survey they group up the data um, in a couple different products, the one-year, three-year, and five-year estimates, which is basically using the, these samples to try to sort of, um, to try to sort of best um, estimate uh, the, 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 true, you know, the true mean over a course of time. Um, using the multi-year estimates, you get increased statistical reliability. The, the margin of errors are smaller, basically, for especially as you're kind of going down into subgroups within the American Community Survey. You can end up in sort of very shaky statistical, like on very shaky statistical ground pretty quickly. Um, this is also a great thing. The Department of City Planning has some amazing resources around using the census. Um, definitely check those out. I've linked um, to some of them in here as well. Um, OK, so as I mentioned, you do need to request a key for the data. Here's the link to do it. Um, here's a best practice for writing code generally. Never hard code your passwords into your scripts. You should be using environment variables, which is a way to sort of like keep your keep your passwords secret, keep them local on your own machine, not sort of transmit them uh, into you know for you know in Google for example, um, Colab. You know then it's just in your um, uh, you know in the internet. Um, and also, if anybody else ever uses your code, right, they're going to have a different they're going to have a different API key from you. But if you if you hard code your API key in here, they're going to use your API key. And if they get up to some nonsense using your API key, they could get you banned from, you know, an API. 
Uh, so what you're going to want to do is make an environment variable, um, an environment file, a .env file. Um, it's very boring. It's just a text file that looks like this, where you have the um, the name of the the API, and the, and you can use you can make anything up here. Like these are just um, you could write anything. You could be like Martha's API key or mortifying Tharma three API, whatever. Um, and it uh, and then set the variable. So I've crossed mine out so that you all don't have my uh, environment variables. But the, but then we use um, we load these subscription keys using a package that in, handles environment variables in Colab. Um, hopefully this runs. Great. Okay. And then you can see I'm reading in my um, I'm reading in my API keys here using um, by just saying the, their names instead of um, instead of typing my passwords in directly. So I've said hey, get the environment variable that corresponds to census API and get the environment variable that uh, corresponds to my GeoClient subscription key. OK, so let's take a look at the API website. We're going to focus on the five-year tables. Um, there are also different geographies that you can use. Um, we're going to look at the uh, zip code tabulation area below. Um, who knows the difference between a zip code and the zip code tabulation area? All right, this is my personal favorite thing in the whole world. What is a zip code? A zip code is a code that the US Postal Service uses to deliver the mail. It has no geography. The Empire State Building, for example, has its own zip code. So if you're ever looking at a map of zip codes and there's not just like one dot for the Empire State Building, then you are looking at a map of a zip code tabulation area, which is a geography that the census created to try to best sort of approximate the mail delivering codes of the US Postal Service. Zip codes are terrible geographies, frankly. The only good thing about them is that people know their zip code. And if I asked you what your census tract is, you're going to look at me blankly. Um, so it's not a good geography, but it is a good way to sort of, when you have information, um, when you maybe got, when you're looking at information that that pe where you want people to know where they are, it's a good it's a good one. Um, okay, so there are a lot um, the the information related to the census. There is a lot. So um, the uh, this is the developer information for the API for the five year ACS um, information. Um, and definitely check this out. There's things change from year to year, and they do a very good job of documenting what changes. Um, and the most important thing is that there are, um, in these, these subject tables and detailed tables, um, there's examples of what the API call looks like and also examples of what the geographies look like and the full tables of all of the variables. So I'm going to open one of these up, but it's going to take a long time to load because they're enormous. Um, and um, in the meantime, this is like what this is an example of all the different geographies that are available for the five year. So you could do the whole you could do the whole country, you could do a state, you could do a county, you could do a city, you could do a micropolitan statistical area, you could do an urban area, you can do a congressional district, um, public use microdata area or Puma. Um, is a very popular one, zip code tabulation area. So there's lots of different geographies. You can say, I want this data by this geography. Um, this is probably not even going to, oh, there we go. So you can see this, do you see how small this dot is on the side for the scroll? This is like the longest table you've ever seen in your entire life. It takes some navigating. But basically, there, there are, um, you know, for every different little like estimate that the census, the American Community Survey has, there is a code. Um, and those codes are in groups, so the, and those groups have topics basically. So we're going to look at one. Um, we're going to look at a. Um, we're going to look. We're going to read in these variables. So this is basically the one I showed you is the HTML version, so like the easy to read on the internet version. But there's also a JSON version, which was in that the, that little list of links there. Um, and if you read in the JSON version, you can see this same table. Um, except it's like really ugly JSON, right? Like all of the information that we're looking for is are in is in like a you know JSON format in this one um, column. So we're going to flatten that out so it's a little easier to read. 
and then take a look at the um, take a look at the different variables. Uh, all right, there we go. So now we've got a nice, you know, this looks more like the table we were just looking at on the internet. We've got the code, we've got what it corresponds to, we've got the, you know, the details, we've got the groupings, the attributes. Um, the way we're looking at this right now is using pandas. So I'm using the pandas package to kind of, you know, interact with and, and um, uh, uh, like rearrange this data into the way that I want it. Um, and I have done a little, you know, done some reconnaissance beforehand, and we're going to look at a variable related to school attendance, which is B14003. Um, or sorry, that's in the group B14003. So those are all the variables related to school attendance. And here we go. Here are all the variables that are in that group. And you can see it's all the different, all the different sort of age buckets and whether or not they're enrolled in school or public school or private school. Um, so, you know, a, a great example of, of, you know, one of the ways you could use this data, right, is if, let's say I were a city and I were thinking about starting a pre-K program and I wanted to know where are the three and four year olds in the city that are not already enrolled in a pre-K program of some sort or are not enrolled in school in some way. Um, what I might do, um, the a sort of slightly annoying thing about this is that it's, 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 it, there's a, a, a variable for female and variable for male. So I'm, we're only going to look at the boys. But um, if I were doing this completely, I would look at both and then add them together, right? And then I would have the full population. Um, but here's the, here's the variable for boys three or four, age three or four, not enrolled in school. Um, and then we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna talk to the census. We're going to do the API call. This is the moment. Um, we have the uh, API call here with, you'll see that basically what I've done is like put together this long string um, with some of the variables that you need in the API call itself. So if we go back and look at the um, example call here, you can see it's api.census.gov slash data slash 2022, I'm actually using 2019 in this example, slash ACS, slash ACS5, question mark, get equals name, group equals, and four, blah, 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 and key, your key goes here. So your key goes here is where your subscription key is going to get put in there. So what I've done is basically take this big, big chunk of text and break it up into the different little pieces. Some of those pieces are always going to be the same. Some of those pieces are going to vary depending on what I'm asking for. So in this case, because I'm asking for the the information related to the detail um, in the detailed tables B14003 underscore 022E, so descriptive. Um, I'm going to put, you know, put all this, uh, put all the stuff from the beginning that https slash api.census.gov slash data slash 2019 slash ACS slash ACS5. Um, and then I'm going to put that together with this code. And then I'm going to tell it what geography I want. So in this case, it is. Uh, for zip code tabulation area in state 36. This 36 is the FIPS code for New York City. Every state and county has a FIPS code. I don't remember what FIPS stands for, but if anybody knows, feel free to hang, shout it out. Um, and that way, I'm basically only getting the zip codes in New York State and not the zip codes from all over the country. And you will see that we have a challenge, right? Because if we're interested in New York City only, there's not, you can either do five different county calls because there are five counties in New York City, or you can take the whole state and then narrow it down. We're gonna take the whole state and narrow it down in this, in this approach. Um, the other parts of my code here are basically, you know, we're using the request package to say, please, you know, hey, census, please get us back all of the information from this URL. And then we're reading it into a, um, uh, we're reading it into a data frame. So let's call the API. That was so fast, right? We just talked to the US Census. Did you guys catch it? It was over so fast. All right, let's take a look at what we got back. All right, look at this. We've got ZCTA names. So ZCTA5, which is the five digit zip code tabulation area, 11804. We have the number of boys that are uh, not enrolled in 2022. And you'll, you'll note that I actually, I actually renamed this in the, in the spreadsheet because what you get back directly from the census 
um, or sorry, I renamed this in the data frame because what you get back directly from the census is like the just it just has the code. And if you have a couple different codes going on at one time, it's very easy to forget what these codes are. So give your be nice to yourself. Give yourself a human readable name for your columns. It makes everything much easier. Um, uh, the state, this is the um, FIPS code. Um, I've committed a grave sin here because this is not actually a zip code. This is a ZCTA, but I've named it zip. I should probably be you know, summarily kicked out of data club. Um, and then I don't know why, but for some reason you get back this sort of like random column with nothing in it. Um, we don't need that column, so we're gonna, we're gonna take it away. Goodbye. Boys not enrolled. Not enrolled in school. Um, three or four year olds not enrolled in school. Yeah, so they're, they're preschool age. Um, and as I mentioned, we've got now 1,794 zip code tabulation areas. So if anyone ever wanted to know the approximate number of zip code tabulation areas in the state of New York, there you go. Fun fact. Um, and the uh, we're going to take a look at what the data types are in this, uh, what, what, it, what it sent back to us. And in this case, it's given us the name is an object. Object means like text. It's a string, essentially. Um, and then the variable that we're interested in, the state and the zip code, are all um, integer values. So integers are, are whole numbers. Floats are decimal numbers. Um, so those are the data types um, we're working with here are strings and integers. Um, I'm going to, because I've worked through this entire problem, I'm going to give you a little hint, which is that you need to make these ZCTAs um, into strings. Otherwise, they're not going to join to the open data shape file that will help you figure out which of these ZCTAs are in New York. You wouldn't know that in advance, but here's a hot tip. Um, I've, I've, I've done that for you. So now we need to narrow down to New York City's ZCTAs. So we're going to get actually a little sneak preview of the open data um, API, which is I'm going to use the open data API to read in the shape file of the New York City zip code tabulation areas. Um, and we're going to go. We're going to have a separate section where we just talk about the Open Data API. So don't worry. This is not the only time we're going to talk about this. But basically, I'm going to grab the URL for the API call for the ZCTAs and read it in using GeoPandas, which is a way to read in geospatially enabled um, information. Um, and you can see there are actually only 178 ZCTAs in New York City. Um, that's way less than the giant number of ZCTAs we have in New York State. So. Um, and then, let, yeah, let's take a look. So this looks like a map of New York City. So that's good. We don't have any big blank spots where we're missing zip code tabulation areas. Um, here we are, a map of New York. Um, and then we're going to look at the data types for the uh, for the um, this ZCTA file. And you can see this is why we changed the type before, that the ZCTA here is stored as an object, is stored as a string. So we're going to use the string matching. We could have also changed the type on this file to be an integer and gone that direction. Doesn't really matter. Either way, they just have to agree. Because if you ask it to say, like, please match these two pieces of information, and then one is a string and one is a number, Python will be like, nah, not going to do that for you. Um, Excel, like when you do that kind of thing in Excel, Excel is like, Excel does a lot of stuff behind the scenes to try to figure out like what it is exactly that you wanted and then like try to deliver it to you, which sometimes is great because you're like, here's a number of a zip code, here's a, here's a, you know, string of a zip code, like these are actually the same, like why don't you just recognize that, please, computer. Um, but, you know, one of the nice things about programming in Python is that you, or really any programming language, is that you really have to be explicit um, and that helps you also avoid doing things that you didn't anticipate doing. Um, all right, so here's a look at that shape file. You can see we've got this really long string of lat long combos. And those are, that's the sort of all of the nodes of the polygon for the zip code tabulation area. There's some really good sessions about geospatial data this afternoon if you're interested in learning more about this kind of stuff. Um, and we've got a modified zip code tabulation area that looks like our zip code tabulation area. Um, <clears throat> another fun fact about New York City zip codes, a few years ago they added a zip code in Williamsburg. And then it took a little while for the census to catch up. So for a long time, everybody was sort of analyzing zip code information about New York City, forgetting that there was this additional zip code in Williamsburg that the post office created. Fun fact. Um, all right, so we're going to merge this together. We're going to use the pandas function merge. We're going to tell it what these two data frames are, the left one being the um, zip code tabulation area shapefile, the right one being the information that we got from the census. 
We're going to use the mod ZCTA column from the left data frame and the zip, the poorly named zip column from the right <laughs> data frame. And we only want the we only want the rows that match. So we're going to use an inner join. In this case, since I've put the smaller table on the left, we could have used the left one too, but we only want the we only want the information that matches. We don't want the rest of the state of New York. Um, so we're going to merge, merge that together. All right, we've got 177 rows. So if you recall, there's actually 178 rows in the zip code tabulation area spreadsheet from uh, or the zip code tabulation uh, area GeoJSON file. So we lost a zip code in there somewhere. I don't explore why that is, but if I were looking, if I were doing this project right, you know, like live or not live, if I were working on this myself, I might go figure out which is that zip code that didn't match and why. Um, so that's a, looking at the shape of your data. It's kind of like a boring, uh, you know, not like the sexiest programming moment, but it is important because that's how you can kind of know and like keep track of how your data is changing shape over, over time. Um, this data now looks like we have the same information we had with that GeoJSON file, right? These, that big geography um, column. But we also have the number of boys who are three and four who are not enrolled in some type of class uh, or some type of school in 2022, and the state and the zip columns from our other data frame. So we've merged these two data frames together into one. Awesome. It's just what we want. And now we can make a map. Um, so I'm using matplotlib here. There's lots of different ways to make maps in Python. Um, there's uh, um, Folium, which we'll use in, the, in another example. There's um, Plotly Express. There's uh, like all sorts of different stuff. Matplotlib is sort of the default um, uh, visualization package for Python, and it does pretty well with maps, actually. So. Um, and the nice thing about these maps is that they're, they're, it, it's good at creating static maps. And if you're ever making maps where you need all of the maps to be the same size and have the same like, aspect ratio, um, it's nice to just spit these out as like PNG files or JPEG files. And then you can put them in slide decks. You can put them wherever on websites. And you know that every time you regenerate the map, it's going to look exactly the same. So if you've ever tried to like screenshot a Google map or like screenshot a QGIS map, you know like. You, if you get it slightly wrong and you look at them next to each other, you're like, oh, this doesn't look the same. And if you like are a weird perfectionist like me, then that annoys you. And this um, is a great solution to that. So here we go. We've got a map of where there are three or four year olds that, um, in, according to the American Community Survey, oh, no. Hold on. What happened? <gasps> what did I? Oh, you know what I did? I thought about changing this to 2022, and then I didn't. But I changed the variable name, but then I didn't change the variable name down here. So let's fix that. Here we go. Moment of truth. There we go. This is actually 2019, not 2022. All right, here we go. We have a uh, choropleth map of zip code tabulation areas in New York City shaded by the number of three or four-year-old boys that are not enrolled in school. Um, this is a great map for looking at the absolute concentration of three and four year olds across the city who are not enrolled in school. One of the things that makes zip codes not particularly great for data analysis is that they are all very different in terms of population size. So the absolute number here might actually really just be reflecting where there are the most three and four year olds as opposed to sort of the highest share of three and four year olds who are not enrolled in school. So that's something to think about when you're Whenever you're presenting data, it's like helpful to have some sort of a base rate in there. Um, and you might want to do it side by side, right? Because for some use cases, the absolute number might be the thing that's most relevant. For other use cases, it's like, you know, what per, where is the highest, where are the neighborhoods with the highest percentage of three and four-year-olds who are not enrolled in school? Maybe that's what you're trying to answer. And in that case, you need a, a, an underlying population, which you can also get from the census. So great. All right. Good job. And then if you want to take the files out of Colab, this is the, the syntax to do it. Um, but we're not going to do that right now. All right, you've learned the census API. Are you ready? You're going to do some census exploration of your own? Any questions on the census before we move on to the open data API? Yeah. Um, so, so you mentioned that zip codes doesn't correlate to population data, yeah. right? So I mean, does the, does the census bureau actually 
divided by let's say um, city council district. The city council district is actually a uh, it's, it's actually pretty flat across. The yeah, yeah. There are some some geographies do try to sort of approximate for population. Census blocks, census tracts are are supposed to be about the same size. So if you've ever seen a like a map of Wyoming census tracts, for example, there's like a census tract that's like a quarter of Wyoming because there's only like you know. 75 people that live there. Um, so census tracts in New York City are very small because um, it's such a densely populated city. So um, there, but n no geography ever is exactly equal, the, the exact same number of people in every single geography. So it's always a thing to keep an eye on. But some, some geographies, you could sort of more trust that the number of people across those different geographies are going to be more controlled for than others. I think census target is 4,500 people. Oh, great. Excellent. Well, there you go. Yeah, that's like all of Wyoming. <laughs> Sorry to any Wyoming. I'm from, I'm from a not New York state myself, so I, I can make fun of the middle. Um, I don't really want to backtrack, but um, I have a hard time getting the GeoSub key. Yeah, you um, still I don't know about the get API that. key, but the GeoSub key is something that I was trying to figure out. Yeah, the, you, for the GeoSub key, um, you need to... Um, you need to register with the with the OTI's API service, and there's a link in the GitHub repository. Hopefully, if I put it in there. Yeah, you got to take it to the developer portal. Which product? It's the Geo Clients product that you're looking for. Oh, okay. I I did sign up for that. Um, I need to click on product once you get in there. Oh, yeah. Okay. I'm very happy to help you out after the session. Um, if anybody wants help getting getting their API keys sorted out, it's complicated, so I totally. Is this being recorded? Yes. Can we get the recording? Yes. Yes. Ooh, I, you know, I don't, um, let's yeah, find out. You don't have to, but it takes too long. But uh, let's, no, let's take a look. Let's, um, we've. Probably the easiest way to do that is to order our um, information here. Let's go back down to the neighborhood. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, this is like flushing, maybe, it looks like. Um, let's take a quick look. Um, so this is NYC not enrolled. This is the name of our data frame. The one with the most is 11368. We're going to move on. Um, no problem. All right, we're going to talk about the Open Data API next. So this one will be really easy. There's no subscription key required, so everybody should be able to um, follow along with this part. Um, if you work with Open Data frequently and you find yourself downloading data sets, this is a great way to um, this is a great way to work with Open Data because every time you call um, against this Open Data set, it's going to be the Open Data set as it is now. So especially with like data that gets updated regularly, it gets updated daily. You don't have to go back and re-download the data and like rerun your thing. Um, you can just say, give me the data as it is now. Great. Um, we're going to work with the, um, who here has used SQL before? OK, awesome. So we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about adding parameters to your um, API calls in this session. Uh, or this part of this, the session. And this is very much like using where clauses in SQL. If you've used SQL before, this should look very familiar. It should feel very familiar. It's just the syntax is a little different, but you can think about it the same way. You're saying, like, give me all the rows where the following conditions are met, or give me these three columns where the following conditions are met. The same way as if you like only specified a couple columns in your select statement, you'd only get those couple columns out of the whole data set. Um, it's very, um, it's very much the same, and the Open Data API documentation is really great and detailed about how to set up these, um, how to sort of add these parameters to your query. Um, so if you get stuck, definitely go take a look at the documentation. It can be super helpful. Um, so we're gonna, um, we're gonna look at an Open Data website or an Open Data, um, <coughs> uh, Open Data set related to dog licensing data. So I'm actually going to I'm going to show this data. We're going to look at this data set first. So if I take this without that sort of .csv at the end, that's just the URL for the data set. So here we are at the dog licensing data. Um, and what I'm going to do is take the API um, take the API uh, key here. So if I go to this API uh, action from the actions thing, I've got an API endpoint to download the file. 
And it's going to tell me how many rows my this data set has. It has 616,890 rows, which is significantly more than the API default, which is 1,000 rows. Um, but that's easy to change. You can either take the JSON or you have an option for CSV. Um, I usually use CSV, but I don't really know why. And then you can copy um, that link right there to the clipboard. And that is the same link that I have here in my uh, URL. So I've pasted this URL in. It's got this eight-digit um, eight code. Every open data set has one. Um, and this is the same, it's basically the same, it's the same URL for every data set in the city, just with that different eight digit code. So even if you just look up that eight digit code, you can swap it into this API call and you'll get a different data set. Um, okay, so we're going to read in this URL just using pandas. That was so easy. Look at that. Um, except, womp womp, we only have a thousand dogs. Are there only a thousand dogs in the city? No, more dogs than that. We know how many. There's like 616,000. Um, we're going to up the limit in the URL. Um, so we actually talked about this a little bit in the last session. Um, the, um, uh, there's two options here. You can either up the limit to like an extremely high number, or you can page through the data. Um, and pagination is probably the more like the better way to do it in terms of just like being a, a good programmer. Um, the lazy way to do it is just to increase the limit to a million, which is or to whatever, which is what I'm going to do. Um, uh, but in Colab in particular, Colab is not going to let you load all 32 million rows of the 311 data set onto Google's like free cloud computing software. They're just going to be like, ah, no, no, thank you. Um, so this is where learning how to use parameters is really useful because if what you're looking for is a specific subset of the data, you're better off subsetting it using the, using the API than trying to load a giant data set onto your computer and then working, you know, narrowing it down from there. Um, in this case, it's big, it's, it's big, but it's not so big. So we can just set the um, limit in our API call here to be 800,000, which is more than the 600,000 um, dogs we have. Um, and the way that I did this is basically at the end of your, at the end of that sort of default API string, you put in a question mark, and that's where you're telling the you're sort of structuring this API call to say like, and one more thing, um, and then you use a dollar sign, and the um, the parameter name here is limit, um, and then you set that limit to be equal to something. Um, generally, like I think, um, yeah, there is there on the Open Data API, it's going to by default do a thousand, but there is no actual limit. So if you're working on your local machine and you want to get a big file out of Open Data, you can just set the limit really high. It just might take a minute to return something, um, and th that was pretty fast though. Um, and then I'm going to read in this new URL that we just made with the limit parameter, and we're going to see that we hopefully have. Um, you'll see like it's taking a minute because it's a much larger data frame than the thousand row data frame. Um, but we should, at the end of the day, have 616,890 dog licenses. So that's not actually dogs. That's not the number of dogs in New York City. That's the number of, uh, of times that a dog has been licensed. So that's uh, an important distinction. Don't go tell your friends and family that there are 616,000 dogs in New York. Um, let's say we want to just examine the phenomenon of the Labradoodle. Um, they've sweeping the nation. Everybody wants a Labradoodle. Um, and actually, wanna, let's, let's take a look at the actual data itself. So um, I'm going to just use a head, uh, use head right here to take a look at the top. You can see we've, for this data set, we've got the animal name, which is truly the most delightful column of data on open data, in my opinion. <laughs> The animal gender, the year that that animal was born, the name of the breed, the zip code, the date the license was issued, the date the license expired, and the extract year, which I think is related to when that um, when that data was cre like taken out of the DOH website uh, or DOH database and put on open data. But um, you should double check in the data dictionary for that one. Um, all right, so we have this breed name, um, so we can use that as a parameter. Um, Let's say we only want all of the licenses where the breed name is Labradoodle. Um, I have in advance looked at all the breed names and made sure that there is a Labradoodle breed name. Um, but here we've got the same thing, right? We were setting our limit over, um, you know, over a thousand because I suspect there may be more than a thousand Labradoodle breed breeds out there. 
Um, and then we're setting the breed name, and you see this little and? So after that limit, I've added an additional parameter. So the same thing you would see like in SQL, right? You would say, um, you know, where the breed name is is Labradoodle and set, you know, limit, or I guess you wouldn't do and limit, but like uh, that's kind of what you're doing here is you're just basically adding on parameters with that little ampersand. Um, all right, let's see the Labradoodles. Okay, I'm gonna read in that URL. And we're gonna take a look. Look at all these Labradoodles. Boo, Zoe, Rosie, Alistair. Oh my God, what a great name for a Labradoodle. Murphy? Okay, Labradoodles all over this joint. Um, and we can see sort of using the info um, function, we can see sort of uh, how many values are missing maybe in a column. So actually the only thing, there's two, there's two Labradoodles with unknown zip codes. Just rogue Labradoodles on the loose. Nobody knows where they are. Um, so let's answer a burning question, which is what is the most popular name for a Labradoodle in New York City? Um, we're going to use group by. I'm using extract year as a thing to count just because it is. Um, there are no non-null values for it. So I'm just having it count those extract years, but it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. You can use any column that has that has complete coverage so that you're counting every single thing. Um, and I'm sorting it, um, yeah, so I'm sorting it by the most popular. Lucy, Cooper, Teddy, Charlie, Bailey, Rosie, Luna, Ruby, Maggie, and Penny. So if you wanna yell and have, if you wanna meet a Labradoodle, go to Prospect Park and just yell, Lucy, and like someone will come. There you go. This is why open data is so crucial, guys. Why do you only get four or five returns on the last one? Uh, the first time we looked at the licenses, and we saw Alistair. Oh, this this um this is this little function that I'm using in pandas right here is is called head. There's head and there's tail, and it basically just says like show me the first five rows. That's the default. If I change the number in here to like twenty, it would show me the top, the first twenty rows, and I would meet Griffin and Jordy and Milo and Edith, another delightful name for a Labradoodle. Um, yeah, it's just a nice way. It's a nice way to take a little peek at your data, um, but it's important that you remember that it's just a little peek, and that's why we also look at info, right? Because by looking at this, I would, might assume that like every single Labradoodle has a zip code, but actually we have two rogue Labradoodles running around, maybe named Lucy. Who knows? Um, we can also do more complicated queries. So in this case, I'm only I'm asking for just three columns, um, the breed name, animal name, and zip code, um, where the animal gender is female. So if we go back to the end of my string here, you can see, or the end of my API call, I've got the same thing, I've set the limit, and I'm using a like full-on select here, basically, right? So dollar sign select equals breed name, animal name, zip code, those are the three columns I want, and where the animal gender equals female. So again, like it's it's tricky because like like why is the, why are there two equal signs here? Like if you write SQL, you're like oh my god, there's so much random, little random stuff in here. Um, but this is where the documentation can really help you out. Um, and the um, uh, uh, the and the it's what really matters is the logic, right? That you can like figure out what it is you're looking for and how you want it to look. And then if you if you know that, you can get there in the in the sort of like nitty gritty, nitty picky string formatting world um, pretty easily. Okay, so here's our more complicated column or more complicated query. We're gonna read in that API. Great, here is, here is the a peak that head function again, just the top, top five rows of these three columns for female dogs in New York City. So look out for a Maltese named the Lola in 10028. Or a Labrador Retriever crossbreed named Chewbacca in 10013. Heidi Bo, the smooth coated Dachshund. Um, anyway, all right, this is kind of a funny example, but it gives you an idea of the, some of the things you can do with the Open Data API. It makes working with Open Data programmatically really easy um, and fun. Questions about the Open Data API before we move on to geocoding? I think unbelievably we managed to be okay on time. Yes. Um, so you got the API from the uh, from the expert uh, window, mm -hmm. uh, but that is like similar to the download file file where it's like a static set of data. If I were to want to like connect my server to a live feed of API, how would I get that? Um, 
You know, that's a good question. I mean, I think you would just have to make periodic API calls. There's not sort of a, um, this is this is probably a little bit outside of my area of expertise, honestly, but um, the uh, there's not like, there's not a different streaming API. There's just this API. Um, so sort of how, how, I don't think there's sort of the ability to have it like notify you that there's new data beyond just like doing a new call and comparing it to what you had before. So I'll have to set up calls and replacing this static API all the time in order to update my data. Yeah, you just have to hit the static API repeatedly basically, yeah. But I think there are probably people here today that could 100% help you with that question in a way that I am not going to be able to. So we'll, let's find you a, a person to help you with that question. Because there, there are definitely people here that, have, that build cool applications on top of open data and probably can answer that question more specifically. Yeah. I mean, kind of going off a certain question, I figured like there's kind of a schedule um, where uh, an algorithm is ran and say once every week where the API gets updated with new data, would that, would that be possible? So the API is all the API always reflects whatever the data is on open data. So each open data set has a update frequency. Um, and so that update frequency is how frequently that data would be change, or at least how, how frequently we check to see if there is new data in that data set, basically. So like if a, if a data set is updated daily and no new data gets added in that t last 24 hours, let's say it's a data set that this doesn't happen super often because most data sets, like, if it's updated daily, that means that stuff is happening every day. But the update frequency is basically like how um, we check every day at, as, you know, to see if there's new data for this data set and we update it if so. Um, and so if you, set, if you were working with the API and you wanted to say, like, check for new data, um, in this data set, like, and the data set update is daily, then you would, you'd want to write your program to hit that API every day to get every, to get new data. If the data is only updated annually, you could check it every day, but like, there's not going to be new data in the intervening period. And every data set has a um, date last updated and a metadata last updated. If you want to get really tricky, you can actually use the API to interact with the metadata as well. So if you wanted to do an API call to check the last time that a data set was updated, that's also possible. Um, so I think some sort of combination of those things probably get to what you're looking at for, which is like, how do I check to see if a data set has been updated? And if so, then pull the new data using the API. OK, last question. Yes. Uh, so in some cases, we have access and um, API using token, which is why we access like sign up for the token mm -hmm. um, using our personal email. But if I were to, so I work for an agency, if I were to set it up for my agency, uh, and I wouldn't want to use my personal token in that case. Like, how would you advise us to work it so that, you know, we set up a connection that even after I leave, the agency can still use it? You don't need a token for API, for the Open Data API at all. So you don't, it's not even a problem. If for the census or for the GeoClient API, I would recommend either using a service account. So if there's like a, um, if you have an email address that's like your agency's, like your team, for example, that like has a service account that most people use, or you can use your work email as well. Um, but I think the service account is probably the way to go if you're going to create. But let's talk about it. Let's talk about it after. I'm going to zip through the rest of this geo client stuff, and then I can stick around after words for question. Okay, geo client API. The geo client API is very handy for geo coding, and this is an important distinction. A reasonable number of addresses. <laughs> Um, if you're doing hundreds of thousands of addresses, um, you should uh, get in touch with, uh, I had wrote this before OTI existed, so I've, I thought I caught all the references to do it, but I maybe didn't. Um, the OTI team, um, or, or through to DCP, and they can talk you through installing GeoSupport on your machine so that you can do, so, or you can look at the GeoSupport documentation and install it on your own machine. Um, and that way you can do a ton of call, like a, geocode a bunch of data much more quickly. But the API is handy if you have like a smaller number of addresses that you want to handle. Um, I mean, and like we're talking like thousands, but if you're if you're in the like millions of addresses, go to Geo Support. If you're in the like south of hundred thousand, two hundred thousand, then I think Geo Client still is a pretty good option. Um, you all you do need a subscription key. There's the link there. It's also in the GitHub. Um, and I've also you know Geo Client is um, it's really amazing. It's free. It gives you so much good information. 
but you do need to you do need to spend a little time invest a little time cleaning up your address data first to make sure it's in a good spot um, to to work with the geocoder. Otherwise, you might get more sort of errors or things you know it might not do as well. So I'm using a package that's called US Address US site or USA Address. I don't know um, depending on how you want to do it. It's really cool. It was um, it was I think funded by the Knight Foundation. It, a bunch of journalists built it as a way to sort of really really quickly kind of parse addresses and clean them up. Um, so this little like um, this thing right here is a kind of a custom function um, that I wrote to create um, to like strip apart an address and put the things that we take the stuff out of it that we need. Um, and then these are two functions um, written actually by Adam Santos um, from New York City Opportunity. Um, to do two different types of geocoding. One is geocoding where you have a street number, a street name, and a borough. And another one is to geocode an intersection where you have an intersection, the intersection of two streets and a borough, and that can give you back a point for that intersection. So we're gonna, we're gonna use the geocode, this one that has the street number, street name, um, borough column. And you can see here, this function says basically like, take the street number, take the street name, take the borough, um, and then send it to the, the API, the GeoClient API, and here's the string you know, for the GeoClient API call. And you can see we've got the house number, the street, the borough, the subscription key, and this is bad pet formatting. Um, and then at the end, we're saying like pass in these three, these four variables to that long string. So what I did before with the census one, where I sort of cut that string into pieces and then added in these variables, this is like the slightly more elegant way to do that, um, is to basically like put it in the um, put it in curly brackets and then pass those variables into the function um, that way. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, that's the that is the call. There's a there's a few different functions in GeoClient. It can do addresses. It can do intersections. Um, and basically, the, the difference is sort of how this, um, how this string is formatted, and the GeoClient documentation can help you out with that. Um, so let's, oh yeah, so then it, it basically says, you know, send that URL in, see if it gets a response. If it does, great, return that address. If it doesn't, say, mm, no dice, no geocode. Um, <clears throat> and then we're going to import some addresses. So I made a little file, and it's on the GitHub account, so you can use the same string. It should work for you as well of restaurants. Um, actually, I asked ChatGPT to make me a file of all of the Michelin-starred restaurants in New York City. And at first, it refused. But then I said, can you make a comma-separated values list? And then it would do it. So you know, there's a fun fact. If you ask for a comma-separated values list instead of a file, the free version of ChatGPT will do that for you. I do not pay for it. Um, OK, so here's a little look at that data. We've got the restaurant name, the address, the city, the state, and the zip. And as we saw before in that function, what it wants is the street number and the street name separately, which is annoying because nobody, generally people don't store that information separately. So we're going to use our friend, the US address parser, to help us out here. Um, and when it, uh, when it does its stuff, it's going to create a little JSON, basically, of the different address parts. And then we're going to take out of that JSON the stuff that we want. Um, so you can see here, this is the parsed, this is the parsed like JSON, right? It's got these different pieces. And we're going to say, I just want the street number and the street name out of here. This is also, this is a small file, so it's pretty easy to just take an eyeball at it. But um, if you have a bigger file, this is a good moment to check to see that you actually got, you know, what you wanted out of the parser. Um, but we also need a borough column. It's not going to take New York as the borough. They have to have the borough name, Manhattan, Brooklyn, Bronx, et cetera. Um, so we're going to make one, except, womp womp, there's a three-star Michelin restaurant in Pocantico Hills, which is uh, Blue Hillstone Barns. Um, but GeoClient is not going to help you out there. Um, so we're going to take that row out. Um, if you didn't take that row out, you would just get an error, basically, that says, I can't geocode this. Um, so you don't have to take it out, but for you know, uh, um, completeness. Oh, also a fun fact about New York City. Does New York City have zip codes that are both in New York City and out of New York City? Yes, there are zip codes along the Westchester and uh, Nassau County border where some of the people live in Nassau and some of the people live in the city. So you can't use zip codes as a, an exact match of New York City. Fun facts. All right, so I'm going to make a column that has the na borough name of, it, of Manhattan in it so that the uh, geo client is happy. And then I'm going to use my function on my data. I'm going to say for every row in this data, 
geocode this row using the street number, street name, and borough um, along the sort of, you know, and go row by row, basically. And here we go. We've got, uh, it takes a second, but hopefully it should be working. There we go. Um, this, if you've got a big data set, it will take a minute. Um, uh, so um, it's sometimes nice. I actually, if you go back and look at this function, you'll see like there's, I have a commented out this print URL thing because I didn't want to print the URL for all of these. But if you want to uncomment that, then you can see sort of where the geocoder is going through your data row by row and each call. So that's helpful to kind of like take, keep an eye on where you are. Um, all right, here's our data. We've got addresses. We've got geocodes. Look at these. It's so ugly. They're just a big blob. It's a big old JSON blob. So we're going to take out from it what we actually want which is, oops, sorry, the, um, we want, uh, let's take a look at what the geoclient is giving back to you. So it's this big JSON, and here are all of the keys. So every single, ev all of these keys are um, a piece of geographic information that we get back about that address, which is truly crazy, right? This is so much stuff. You've got the community district number. You've got the school district. You've got the civil court district. If you ever wanted to know if you're going to sue a Michelin-starred restaurant, which civil court district are you going to go to, here you go. Um, you've got the segment length, the lion sequence number, the BBLs. The, it's, it's like a slightly overwhelming amount of information, actually. But there is a good data dictionary for all of this stuff um, that you can use to help uh, um, Figure it out. We're going to take the latitude, longitude, and BBL for each address out of this, out of these um, uh, these giant sort of JSON blobs. Um, and here we go. We've got one final data set here that's got um, uh, the um, restaurant name, address, city, state, zip. The I've I've left all the sort of ugly stuff of my data in here. But at the end, we've got latitude, longitude, and borough block lot. Woo! OK, and then finally, we can make a little map with this information. Um, we're going to turn it into a shape file. We're going to use geodata to, or um, actually, actually, we don't need to do this. But um, if we were using, um, and this, I'm using Folium, which is a cool like interactive map um, package. I'm going to tell it where the map center should be, which is I'm just taking the average of the latitudes and longitudes, which should give it a pretty good center point. Um, and then I'm saying uh, make a map where the location is the map center. Whoa, no. People are going to get this last moment. But here we go. Here we go. There's a map of uh, New York City three-star restaurants. <laughs> Truly the least useful map in the history of open data. Um, but uh, um, you know, the hard thing is that I, I was like, I'm going to use an open data set. But all of the open data sets are geocoded. So re-geocoding an open data data set seemed kind of dumb. So I was like, I'm going to make a new data set. All right. That is the end of our session. It's 1.15. Thank you, guys. <laughs>